Hello, can people hear me now? If you can hear me, can you just drop a line in the uh, question box to say that you can hear me? Ah, yes, we're live now. Great. Sorry, we had a bit some technical difficulties at the beginning there, just trying to get live and so people can hear me. Brilliant. Glad to hear people can now hear. Sorry about that at the beginning. It's always a bit difficult on new uh, technology and what's going on. We've changed uh, our web platform purely because people, for some strange reason, wanted to have a picture of or a video of ourselves embedded into the uh, text as well. So I'm not too sure whether you wanted that or why you wanted that, but we've, we've tried to accommodate and there we go. So I'm still waiting for some people to drop in. We had quite a, last, uh, a lot of last minute rushes uh, coming through as always, uh, but I'd like to welcome people that are already on here. So Harper, Amicus, Transition, TaylorMade, Premier, Invictus, Nicole Curtin, Hall Recruitment, Sarah West, uh, Mace, uh, WH Employment, uh, Goldman Fine, Kensington, ARV Solutions, Bonbon, uh, Taste Hospitality, The Recruitment Group, Indigo Stone, Autograph, The One Group, Exact Resourcing, The Contract Doctor, some people from Office Angels are on as well, Edgewell, Vantage, uh, and they keep coming as well. So there's lots of people on uh, from there, which is great to hear. Um, I hope you've all had a really good week. Uh, I know it's starting to get a little bit more surreal and a little bit more stir crazy out there, but hopefully these training sessions will help you to start upskilling yourself for when the market starts to return. I just want to give it a couple more minutes as a, a couple more people are, are trying to log on. I've had a couple of people saying that they can't uh, get in. Let me just try answer that person uh, to tell them why. Uh, Let's try a reboot and a rejoin. Okay, send that off to somebody. Okay, because they're trying to get in. They don't understand why they can't get in. Okay, so what do I want to do? I'm going to kick off. So I was asked in the last two or three sessions that we've done about pulling a session together on actually building a pipeline and building a pipeline that lasts to make sure that what you're doing out there between now and when the market kicks off gives you the best advantage to really hit the ground running and go from naught to 100 miles an hour straight away. So I've pulled together lots of things that we've talked about over the last two or three weeks, and I'm starting to really expand those now quite heavily to give you a true roadmap to delivering a building a pipeline now so when things start to move you know exactly where you're going what you're doing and and, and where you're going with your client base and your candidate base so it's important to know that you know during this period of time of downtime you know you'll still be recruiting and you'll still be doing bits of work here and there what you'll also suddenly find is that during this downtime is that it's an opportunity to do all those things that you wanted to do that maybe you couldn't do in the past that maybe has been put on the back burner. And I always class that as being, you know, you are missing what's strategically advantage to you because you're working on what is urgent for your business. And what's urgent for your business sometimes isn't the best thing from a strategic point of view to carry on growing the business and prevent that boom and bust. So this is all about preventing the boom and bust as we come out of that and doing the right things from there. So we're gonna look at all these Ps from here, the possibility, priorities, prepare, pitch, penetration, prevention, pricing, prospects and protection to make sure that we're fully aware of where we need to be going and what we need to be doing. Now, having spent just short of 30 years in recruitment and having sort of built and dealt with some extremely good recruiters. These are people who have been billing a million pounds plus. These are people who have been billing 750,000 pounds plus per annum, both permanent and contract type of people. One of the guys that I had the pleasure of working alongside was billing in excess of $2 million a year over in the States. And again, some of these comments, uh, some of these uh, techniques we've picked up from, from people like that. So it's important to think it's not just theory. These are what people have been implementing for years and years and put into place to make sure that they absolutely capitalize on the marketplace constantly. So possibility is the first place that we look at. And the possibility is all about what you have in your CRM 
and what you have in your current client base at this moment in time. So you need to take a magnifying glass now and really look at your, your client base and look at what's going on. So you've got to really re review your client base. And I always think about reviewing your client base in three significant ways, okay? The first thing is we need to look at clients, our growth clients, our cash cows. Who are our cash cows? And what are they doing? We need to make sure we understand what they are. We're going to talk about what they're doing a lot later on. The next type of client we need to look at is our prospect clients. Who's got a prospect of actually starting to grow and grow quickly and grow large? Give us large numbers of opportunities, large number of replacements. And they're what we call our cash calves. The next thing I always look at is our problem clients. What clients are causing us problems? What clients are slowing us down? What clients prevent us from doing our job and yet for some reason we carry on working with these clients? What are we doing with those clients? Once we understand what our client sort of review looks like and we've got a good understanding of where we should be targeting and what we should be targeting, we need to go a little bit further into that. So we need to then start to review our candidate base. We need to review our candidate base in a very specific way. We need to know who's passive in the marketplace, but who's serious, who's serious moving. So have we actually gone into our market, uh, our uh, CRM and looked at our database and actually graded, graded the candidates that are going on there and know exactly what they're doing. The next one we need to know is the active marketplace. Who is great in that marketplace? Who's a brilliant recruit to make? Who's a brilliant candidate to take to the marketplace? Do we know who they are? And again, do we know who our time wasters are within that marketplace? So we should be grading our CRM. We should be marketing to our CRM constantly because that means if we look at our growth clients and our prospect clients, if we have a really strong candidate base matching that, then all of a sudden we know we've got a possibility to be moving forward straight away. The next part is we need to grade each client and we need to grade each client on a simple thing, time to fill, how long does it take you to fill a job? And then we look at job to CV, CV to interview, and interview to deal ratio. And I always look about it in this way. If you looked at your candidate and client base and looked at the last lower 20%, Lower 20% we should be looking to get rid of. So clients, should we sack them? Should we review them and get rid of them? Candidates that we haven't spoken to for years and years and years and the CV's out of date, let's remove them from our database because it means it, we're cleaning our database up and we're speeding things up. The middle part, that 80%, that's the bit we need to start to develop. We need to develop those clients and those candidates that could potentially make us money, but we aren't too sure what money we can actually make out of them and why we're going to make that money. And then we start to look at the top end, the 20% that we need to develop and expand and grow those clients. But again, we need to grow those clients properly. So we need to prioritize and we need to prioritize our list of what's going on. So to prioritize, we need to look under the microscope at our current business. And so we're going to look very closely at time and money and those lines. In this graph here, the dots, the circles, they represent our clients. And our clients are gonna to come to us in a number of ways. And we look at our clients in a very, very strict way. And the people that I always find that have been the best at recruitment have always looked at their client base on a very regular basis. I'm not talking quarterly, I'm not talking half yearly or annually. I'm talking virtually on a weekly basis they're grading their clients constantly so they know where they can put, spend their energy and focus their time so the first part is the top right corner the top left corner they're looking at where they spent low time but they have high profit so for the amount of time they've invested they're creating lots of profit from there the next time is that bottom left hand corner where you've spent low time invested in clients and you're making low profit and the next place we look for is where we're investing a high time with clients, but we're getting low profit from those clients. And the final place that we start to look is where time where we invest lots of time with clients and we're making lots and lots of profit from those clients. And the idea is we want to draw all our clients towards that top right quadrant. If we can get our clients on that top right quadrant, we know we've got some really good cash cows. But it's about looking at the marketplace it's about looking at the clients around our marketplace to see what's going on which cash calves can we start to create to actually build our marketplace 
we need to start thinking about if that's our target area that we want to drive our clients in, every client that sat outside of that target area, should we be working with those clients? What should we be doing with those clients? Because it's those clients that generally slow us down in the marketplace. And we've got to think, if we've got more than one or two clients in that top goal quadrant, you know, is that enough? Are we driving more clients in there? So that means we've got to really spend some time preparing ourselves and understanding our clients. So once we know where our clients are on that graph, we have a choice to work with them or sack them. But before we start to work with them and sack them, what we've got to start to do is now prepare our strategy to go forward and prepare our marketplace because then we know who we can focus and we who can focus what strategy on with each individual client. So we need to start to prepare and we need to start to prepare our marketplace. And preparing our marketplace is very, very simple. We need to look, first of all, at a better service offering. All of a sudden, the market has hugely changed. If you go back three weeks ago and look at what you were offering your clients three week, weeks ago, very few will have been offering a true digital process. Very few have been offering that type of process that enables clients to see their candidates from, via video, etc. But not only has the digital process suddenly come in, what clients are now looking for is also changing. Because what this market has sort of eke out is those candidates and those employees that are really worth their weight in gold. If you think about furloughing staff and you think about furloughing business, okay, they're going to keep the people on furlough that they really, really want. They're going to keep those top echelon employees in the business. The rest they will get rid of at some point. This is an opportunity here for clients to almost clean house. Now, what that means is if we understand the behavioral focus of our clients because remember most clients recruit on skills and fire on behaviors the people they're going to keep in their business are the people that are most behaviorally aligned to their business because we can always train their skills so now we need to start to understand the true behavioral factors within our client base so we can start to recruit the candidates that have the same factors so we could should be now speaking to our clients more and more about the behavioral factors they'll be looking for when candidates come back on the marketplace when the employment starts to increase again what are they going to be looking for which means we've got to think about how we market our candidates to our clients long gone now should be the days where we're just speaking to the candidates and verbally telling the candidates about the client we can now create digital packs with video and inserts into those packs that we can send to candidates about our client. We can work with our clients to create those digital packs, which also creates a better opportunity for you to sell the opportunity to your candidate and to your client, but it also lifts you above the service level agreements that you currently have with your clients. So video is gonna become really important and that video technology now that we have becomes paramount to the recruitment process. It will expedite the recruitment process for candidates and for clients. How many times has a client read a CV and thought that candidate looks really, really good, only to find when that candidate sat in front of him, within five minutes, they're thinking, I do not want to see this person. They're not worth my time. But out of courtesy, they have to probably sit there for an hour and interview this candidate. So video now can prevent that because you could be sending small video snippets of candidates, an intro of that candidate to our client, and clients will come back and say, there's something about that candidate I didn't like, and therefore you're going to prevent candidates and clients meeting where nothing's actually going to occur. So we can rec reduce the time it takes to recruit by using video technology in more than just one way. We also got to think about that onboarding process. And what can we do with that onboarding process? Can we help our clients onboard our candidates in a better way? Again, digital technology can help with that. Can we prevent, uh, create digital onboarding packages that candidates can use to make sure that once they walk through that door, everything's already set up for them when they start work? Can we be part of that? Is that an extra benefit that we can add to our clients? And then the amount of AI that's coming in. The amount of AI that's coming in is huge. 
and I've been speaking to a number of companies just recently about AI pre-screening. Pre-screening, not candidates that's going for a job, but pre-screening your database and screening your database properly so you understand what candidates actually do and what skills they have and therefore you can see which clients they are applicable to and therefore you can grade your candidates absolutely right so ai can start to do pre-screening things for not only jobs but also for your database which again speeds up your recruitment process and means that you're providing a better quality candidate to your client constantly because you know which candidates are right on your database you then know when you have to go to the job boards and why you have to go to the job boards. So that preparation is really important because what we need to do is when we start to go through our clients is we need to compartmentalize our clients properly. So we know when we're building a pipeline, we know why we're focusing on that client and what we're going to sell to that client. So every client is a contingency opportunity, but do we know which clients are truly going to be always a contingency opportunity and which clients might be an exclusive opportunity. Can we sell an exclusive opportunity into that client, an ex exclusive process into that client? Do we know why they would buy that? And what have we got that would make them work with us exclusively? So we now know we've got two different types of clients that we can start to focus. We've then got clients that could potentially take retained recruitment. So we're now gonna to start to get paid for what we actually do. But do we know which client that is that we should be pitching that to? And do we know how to pitch that solution to our clients? And then we've got the final one, and I've just labeled this recruitment services, a bigger opportunity, a bigger client that may have lots and lots of requirements through a year. Can we offer them a recruitment service that is very different from just your normal bum on a seat service? And once we start to understand them, we've prepared what our service looks like. We've got to acid test it. We've got to see what the perceived value is from the client's perspective, but also from the candidate's perspective. If we can see the perceived value and they can see the perceived value, it means when we sell our services to our clients, it means we can sell them in a far better way and get a higher fee or get more exclusivity or more retained business than we have before. So there's a shift in the marketplace and that shift is now about us preparing to get ready to work in a marketplace that is changing now forever. So we're gonna work on our pitch and our pitch is always been very similar. Every client that I've been working with and every client I've started to work with have always said the same things. They've always said, when we go out to pitch, we listen to what the client has to say, we understand what the client wants, and then we pitch all of our service in one big bundle. And so we sat there, not differentiating our service at all, giving it all in one bundle. And then we're pricing that bundle before the client is even decided what they want. And the client is deciding what they choose, not based on the actual services that we're offering, but normally based on price. So we've got to learn to pitch in blocks. We've got to learn to pitch in blocks so clients can see what they are looking at and what they're buying. And if you think about how you buy things nowadays, especially on the internet, and you buy services, you normally buy services now in different formats. You can buy the free service, you can buy the light service, you can buy the gold service, etc. So what we've got to do is start to pitch in those blocks because by doing that, you're going to make the client make the decision on the strategy that they want. So if you can show the service that you provide in different compartmentalized blocks and the client can understand those services, then they will pick their strategy. And then what you do is you price accordingly. And by pricing accordingly, then you can get the opportunity to keep your prices high rather than reducing your prices. Because in the past, when we've pitched all our business all at once, what's happened to our pipeline is, oh, I'm going to pitch that at 25%. The client says, well, all my other agencies offer that same service at 25, at 15%. And we instantly drop our pants because we don't understand what we can negotiate. We don't understand the variables that we can trade with our client to do things. So we should be now pitching, as we say, in blocks or in chunks. And 
this graph that I'm going to show you now is very generic. It's very quickly pulled together, but it gives you the idea of exactly what I'm talking about. So if you look at that graph, as we go across the graph, our basic recruitment skill base is offering our client a contingency based. So just a basic job spec, database search, put a job on an advert, vet the candidates, and off we go. We can now start to see by adding an extra layer in what we can offer when we offer an exclusive service. And you can see all the different things that we can may add in. And there's lots of other things that candidates and sorry, uh, you guys as consultants can add into your lists that make them better and fuller, make you a little bit more unique. Then you look at the retained type of service. And then you look at the recruitment service. And I'm going to go talk about pricing later, about how we're going to price these on a different level. But what we've got to think about at the moment when we start to look at these services, we look at how the client reviews these services and how they see the value in these services. And they see the value very much in this way. They see the value, the contingency. It's free to them. It's free. And clients have got this great mindset of if we get lots of agencies competing, then we get lots more opportunity to see the better candidates. When us, as us recruiters, we know that that isn't true. We know that if we're in a contingency based foot race, we tend to shy away from that if we've got more exclusive or more retained work because we feel we've got a better opportunity to place that. We need to be honest with our clients and start to tell clients that that's what happens on contingency. And that's why they do not get the best candidates in the marketplace. But then talk about exclusivity. It's still free at this moment, but it's a better opportunity to make a placement. And as you can see, as we go up this line here, the paid and pay, part paid and paid, the gold bar is getting bigger and shinier because the more we get paid to do an actual job and the more we think about that, the more recruitment will change. Recruitment has changed. In the early, sort of late 80s, early 90s, when I came into recruitment, Permanent recruitment was like this. You went out and you spoke to a client. You won the permanent recruitment off that client. You won an advertising budget off that client and the client paid an advertising budget to you to advertise their jobs. All recruitment agencies at that stage had deals with the Times, the Telegraph, the Sunday Times, the Financial Times, Computer Weekly, etc. whatever you were recruiting in. And you'd be saying, the rate card for that page or half page or quarter page, whatever they were taking in that press is a thousand pounds and the client would pay you a thousand pounds. And you had a deal with your your newspaper that you'd be getting 50% rate card because you're bringing lots of business to them. So you'd be getting that for five, 500 pounds. So you're making 500 pounds straight away. So on the big campaigns in the Times and the Telegraph, when it was 20 grand a time to advertise, we were getting 10 grand up front. So that was like getting a retainer. And that wasn't refundable because that was an advert. And then the internet came along and we started doing recruitment for free because we were advertising for free, but yet we were still paying for that advert. Well, now's an opportunity to start to claw that back by offering recruitment services and getting paid for those services. So to make sure that we do the right things constantly for that. So we've got to start to penetrate our client and understand our client because by penetrating our client, you're going to safeguard the actual pipeline that you're starting to build. You know the clients that you want to now pitch to. You know what you're going to try pitch to your clients. Now we need to penetrate those clients. And to penetrate your clients is very simple. We need to understand your sponsor. The person that you normally deal with in the client, if you can understand your sponsor and who you normally deal with in your client, and you can get that client to actually spread your good word and your good message across their business, you start to get a more in-depth knowledge of the client. You start to infiltrate that client. But you've got to make sure that your sponsor is the person that has the final say-so. If not, you've got to get your sponsor to drive you into the C-suite. Because driving you into the C-suite means that you are then talking to the ultimate decision makers. And if you're in a small agency, it might be you as a director selling into that person. It might be someone lower down as a consultant selling into that person. So we should think about level selling. 
So people at the appropriate levels selling to the people, people at the appropriate levels within that business. Therefore, you're getting sticky within that business. You've got more than just one person speaking to that business. You're speaking to the tr true key holders within that business, and you're doing what it takes to understand that business fully. Once we understand the C-suite level, we need to understand what the total spend on recruitment actually is. We need to understand how many hires per year they're going to have, how many hires in each niche area they're going to have, what problem hires they currently have, and what potential new skills they may be bringing in. Once we understand the total spend on recruitment and the market that we are in, what they're spending in that market, we can start to assess how valuable that client is to us. We can start to assess how we're going to pitch that client from a pricing point of view, whether it be contingency, exclusive, retained, or a recruitment service. We now understand what we actually pitch that client and why we pitch that client. One thing we need to understand from our client is the three reasons why people actually leave the business. We need to understand what they can change and what we can help them change because we can help them retain staff longer. Yes, in inverted commas, it may be doing is out of a recruitment job. But if we can prove our value of recruitment that we're sending them better clients and they're going to retain those and they're going to retain those candidates longer, then all of a sudden we become a more valued service to them. And so we've got to understand why people are leaving. So can you change that? What is the reason that we can do? We need to understand what is the manpower needed in the immediate future. How many people are they going to recruit immediately? Once the whistle goes and we start to recruit again, what is it? How many people are they going to need and where are they going to go? So now we can start to focus on a different client because different clients will have different needs. What's going to happen in the next three months once that whistle goes? Then six, then 12 to 18 months. And we're starting to get a view now of their total recruitment strategy over long periods of time. So we can see their peaks of when they need candidates. We can see the troughs when they're not going to be recruiting, but we can also see the volume. And by seeing the volume, we can understand how we can price and drive our prices up and become a more valued member of their business community and not just that recruiter doing a contingency job on the end of the phone. So we need to understand what our client's biggest attraction threat is. And what I mean by that is what's going to stop candidates being attracted to that client? What is the threat? One of them could be the reason why people are leaving. Other could be how they are perceived in the marketplace. Other could be their competitor threats, which we'll also talk about. You also need to know who your competitors are within that marketplace. If you know who your competing agencies are and you know the type of service they provide, you need to understand what you can do to beat that service to overcome their service, to become the key influencer within that marketplace. But also in this day and age, we now need to understand what outside threats do you and your client face. For those who studied business, you'll understand this graph here. This is Porter's Five Forces. In the center, Linda, you've got the industry rivalry. And that's where your client sits in that industry rivalry. And you're trying to keep that business in that inside there. You've got the threats of new entrances, so new recruitment agencies coming into the marketplace. You've got the threat of substitutes, so other systems that they could use, AI, they could all get hold of LinkedIn nowadays, you know, they could put in internal recruitment, RPO, etc. You've then got to think about the bargaining power or bargaining power of the buyer, the bargaining power of your client. What is that power like? But then you've got to think about the bargaining supply uh, power of the supply and the supply is the candidates that you're supplying into them and the service that you can supply into them. And what bargaining power have you got with that? Because once we understand all of those, then we can start to sort of move on to the next part, which is the prevention. We need to start to think about preventing things happening to us within these business. So we need to be in bed with the C-suite and be talking to the C-suite constantly so we do not get usurped by another agency or another process or another rivalry that's talking to the C-suite where we're not. Legal is another blocker within the marketplace because legally they can say, well, we don't, to do with it. we don't agree terms and conditions on that. We don't agree with this, etc." So legal might stop you from recruiting in there. So you need to understand, are you talking to the legal department 
and understand how that works to make sure that you get the best legal contract that you can out of that client. And that goes with finance as well, because finance can also stop you recruiting the days it takes to pay them, your day of sales outstanding, the payment terms that they present to you, the percentage fee, they may prevent you on the percentage fee, etc. So you've got to think about those things because they could be prevention blockers to us. But then we start to go into the real industry things. HR. HR and internal recruitment. HR is a buying power, but it also can bring in new entrances. But it also can bring in threats of substitute, such as internal recruitment. So HR becomes a very powerful being within a marketplace. So when you start to penetrate your market and you want to grow cash cows and cash calves, if you're avoiding HR and not helping HR at their job, they will at some point push you out of the business. So you've got to work with HR and enable HR to do their job and do their job well. If you can help HR do their job, then all of a sudden it becomes a whole different prospect. I was speaking to a client of mine the other day and she was saying she got a really, really great call from an internal recruiter who was so pleased with the placement that she made with them last week. Yes, people are still making placements. She made a placement with them last week. And she said the internal recruiter thanked her because it helped her hit her targets and it helped her to look good to her boss. So helping people such as HR internal recruitment is really important. But you've got to understand your external competition. You've got to understand what's going to happen once you start to grow within a client, other agencies are going to start knocking on that door. Once a client starts to really grow and expand and their needs become greater, other agencies will want part of that. So you've got to understand how you can prevent that. And that's by always being on top of your service levels and driving service levels. And then the next thing is the new entrance, in, in, uh, new, internal, new in, external threat, sorry, into the marketplace. AI is going to be a huge problem to us because AI, now clients can start vetting candidates. Clients can start using LinkedIn and they'll start to use it more. What this process has done is it's brought absolutely paramount to the client's mindset. Can they do things in a better, more cost-effective way? Can they do them cheaper? They will always come back to recruitment for niche market roles. But are we going to start to lose even more of that low-hanging fruit by new external threats that the client could purchase that will help them recruit quicker and faster so we've got to be aware of all these things to move forward and that then goes into how we start to price our jobs and what we do in pricing we've got to think when we start to price a job it's very important that you price your service properly you've got to look at the value of your service you've got to look at the value that it's going to give to the client and does the client see the perceived value and understand it. Do they understand that? You've got to give a comparison against your service against other people who are going to be absolutely knocking on the client's door and offering a perceived similar service. So your value has to be out there. So your features, advantages and benefits have to be absolutely nailed down. So when you're pricing it, you've got to make sure you've got a good feature, advantage and benefit to your client to be able to price that properly. So that moves on to the options, the options that we can give when pricing. So we have our fixed fee, which is our usual contingency recruitment. It's fixed at a percentage and we provide that and it's first person past the post gets that fee. So we know how that works and we should be thinking about ways that we can improve that and drive those fees up by giving a better quality service. Part of the fixed fee is also exclusive roles because exclusive roles tend to be contingent so again although it's a better opportunity to make a placement can we drive our fees up for that by providing a better service so fixed fee is there the next thing is retained fees retained fees generally work where they pay for your engagement then they pay for a short list and then they pay for the final placement if you're putting a retained service in front of a client, you've got to make sure two things. One, your contract is what we call divisible. And that means each individual section part of your contract is a separate contract in its own self, in its own identity. So if they engage your services, that is all they are doing. They are engaging your services as a recruiter. 
They are not engaging your services to find anybody. They're engaging your services for recruiting to work on a specific role. It doesn't say that you're going to fill the role, just as a specific role. The next one is for a short list of candidates or an interview list with candidates. And then the final one is for the final placement. And if you make it divisible, what that means is that if the client suddenly doesn't make a placement at the end of the day and they get a bit annoyed with you, they might take you to court. And if you haven't made your contract divisible, then a court of law will see it and say, well, you haven't provided an end product, therefore you need to give that money back. So you need to make sure it's divisible. The second thing about retained services is you need to make sure that you can actually place the candidate in a retained job. I see too many clients that take on retained services on jobs that they know they can never fill, but they never actually mention that to the client. They've almost skate, skate over that with the client. You've got to make sure that you can fill that job or you tell the client the time scales it's likely to take. It might take you 12 months to find that person. If you think about headhunters, they take roles on retained basis, but they might spend a year headhunting that person out. So you have to make sure the client understands what retained service actually means. And you have to be certain that if you're going to take a retained job on, that you're confident that you have the database that can facilitate a candidate for that client or you know where those candidates are and you can access those candidates easily and you can make a placement from there. The next one, which I think is going to become more the norm within recruitment, if you really want to grow a big agency and work properly in a big agency, and that's recruitment services. I'm already working with lots of clients who are now trying to provide recruitment services to clients. Some are now succeeding and have signed off some really lucrative deals for recruitment services. So these are clients that are genuinely cash cows or have projects that are on short term. And what I mean by that, they might suddenly say, I need to recruit 10 people for this project or over the next 12 months, I'm going to take 200 people, 100 people, 50 people. If you start to look at that and think about that as individual fees, what would that cost the client if the client came to you and gave you an opportunity on an individual basis? So if they said, you know, here's a role, we need 50 roles in the next year, our average fee is 20% and our average salary is that, what would that cost them over the year? Work it out and then give them a discount. Give them a discount and roll in and say, what we will do is every month you will pay me a retainer of X and you make it a worthwhile retainer. So above your average monthly uh, target that you give your consultants and your client will pay you that. They can make zero placements or 20 placements a month. That is all they pay, the retained fee. It means you've got guaranteed income coming through. But what it also means is that you are servicing your client on a certain area or all their business. And by doing so, you then need to command the candidate marketplace because you're going to try find these candidates constantly to fulfill your client's needs to keep that retained service going, or that recruitment service, sorry, going. So if they're paying you every month to do that and you're providing them with lists of candidates that you've interviewed face to face, what they're getting paid, all the data that they need, and they can then take those candidates and put them through the recruitment process and make placements as and when they see fit, then all of a sudden you become a benefit to that client. But on the flip side of that, what you find is that you are finding every candidate in the marketplace and every candidate that's not right for them may be right for another client. So it means you're growing a very niche candidate pool or a big candidate pool that you can then start to market out and make residual placements. So rather than just making one or two placements a month, you might be making four or five placements a month just because you're working with one client on a recruitment service type based contract. And it's about fulfilling those clients needs if you've got four or five of those clients in that way then all of a sudden you've got a really good business moving forward if you think about what we did in the fast about key accounts you build a key account but again it was still only paid when placed we're now talking about a true recruitment service so it's a cross between an rpo and really a recruitment service and drive those recruitment services in so we've got to make sure we're doing that and driving that properly so that means we've got to make sure that when we prospect our business we prospect properly and prospecting our business is really important. We've got to gaze into the future and look at our current client base. Who is going to be a contingent client? Who is going to be an exclusive client and who is going to be a retained client and who is going to have 
recruitment services. If we know now which clients are which and how we're targeting that, because we've got all the information about what their recruitment need and their expenditure recruitment, now we can really focus our pipeline and where we're gonna go with our pipeline. We can then start to think which clients are similar to the clients that we already have that we also should be targeting. So we can start to target new clients. You can target who, who are we targeting? Why are we targeting them? And what are we going to target them with? If we suddenly understand those things, then all of a sudden our BD becomes very, very focused. It's just not a day with a list of clients that we're gonna call and we're not too sure what we're gonna get out of those clients. It's a target list of clients that you know exactly what you're pitching to that client, why you're pitching and what you're trying to do to beat your competition in those clients. So we have to be absolutely on point when we build our pipeline and make sure that when we are actually utilizing our pipeline and looking to go and penetrate our pipeline we know exactly why we're doing that so who the current client base are and what we're doing with it and who a new client base is and why we're pitching and what we're pitching to that way we can ensure that we are always looking at our boom and bust mode and to make sure that we are increasing the peaks and making them higher and reducing the valley and making that higher still. So we don't have that boom and bust. We have a continual line of business going through constantly. Do you know your cash cows drying up? You should have business coming through. But if you've just been lazy and let that cash cow dominate your life and not done any BD and not grown a pipeline and haven't got target clients, then you will have boom and bust very, very quickly. We've got to make sure that when we come out of this process and we come into the new world of working, we take the new things with us. We learn from the past and do the right things. So that talks then about protection, the protection of our client base and what's going on. And protection is really important. And if you go back to five, uh, Porter's Five Forces, there's lots of pressure on your client. So you need to protect your client constantly. You need to protect your client and protecting your client can only be done in a number of ways. You've got to provide new services to your client. You've got to continually come up with new offerings and new services and improve your services and improve their services to their client that they perceive as value. You've got to align your offering with your client to make sure your client understands the value of you as a business and a partner. And therefore, beneficial costing is going to be really paramount to your business. And if I said to you, you could take 20 grand a month from a recruitment service type of client and they might make 10 placements that month or do you take a re contingency with that client and make it have an opportunity to place at 20 percent at all those clients at 50k fees you've got to make a business decision on what you believe is the best for the business and at this day and age i think if you're getting in bed with a client properly and they're paying you for your services month in month out irrespective of results of placements, all of a sudden you become a benefit to that client that when they turn the tap on, you know that you can fill those roles and therefore you're safeguarding your business because you've got perpetual income coming in. It's not starting at zero every month. And you have to think about the same of that with the contract market. If the contract market or the temp market is being built and you're building a good contract and temp market on the back of this, then you've got to think what happens when those contracts run down? What happens if they stop? You've got to have new clients coming through. So again, it's about aligning yourself with the clients and improving your service and improving your customer service because to clients, it's all about perception. It's the perception of you as a business. It's a perception of what you provide to your business. And that perception is sometimes compounded by what candidates say as they walk through the door about how your customer service has been with your candidates. So it's important that your in customer service massively improves. Your ability to deal with clients and candidates increases and improves. Therefore, marketing constantly out to clients is really important. And I saw a post a couple of weeks ago and I, I commented on a post and got an awful lot of comeback from the comments in a positive and a negative way. The post was, um, I now do not do any cold calling. I get all my business from my marketing. And someone who said, well, if you're not cold calling, 
then you won't grow your business. And I said, well, actually, I think there's two things that we need to be doing on there. The two things that we need to be doing are very, very straightforward. If you are marketing and getting all your business from marketing, then you'll soon lose that edge of closing and you'll soon lose that edge of finding new clients. So therefore, as the market starts to come back and everyone now suddenly understands that marketing to clients through social media platforms, et cetera, et cetera, is the way to do business, then all of a sudden your client will have lots of choice because they'll have lots of marketing opportunities to take up. Where well, at the moment, few agencies do that. So as that starts to expand, which means we go back to them what the cold calls are good at, closing down clients and finding new opportunities. So we've got to make sure that we're marking out to our clients, but we're also doing lots of BD and learning how to close our clients properly. The next thing, we need to make sure we own the candidate base. So we can't neglect a candidate base. Now's an opportunity to absolutely look at our CRM, grade our CRM properly, and create value out of our CRM because it's value that our clients perceive. If you can bring really good candidates to your client constantly, then they will see the value in your partnership and they will drive that partnership constantly with you. So we've got to think to conclude, we've got to be really, really sharp. You need to know your own client base. You need to grade it. You need to focus on the clients that will make you money and you need to sack time wasters. Do you have cash cows and cash cars or not? You know, do you have cash cows or not? Or are you not even in the field? And what I mean by that is not the best English I know. Um, do you have cash cows and dash cash calves? Do you have them now you're working them or are you not even in the field? You're not even in the field of cows. You're stood on the outside because all you've got is one client that does one placement every six months or every, every year. And you've got lots of those little clients that you can't really build anything from because you're always reinventing the wheel. So you need to start to find those clients that provide lots of opportunities for you. You need to prepare and update your service offering now. You need to pitch high and be proud. You need to penetrate our client base, okay? Not your client base our client base because our client base is about the business it's about the business penetrating it's not just about your client base it's our client base so if you can cross sell and you can vertical sell then do so if you can sell into levels do so it means you become stickier within that client you've got to work that it's our client not your client you've got to know your sponsor and know your threats within your client and you've got to know your clients worth to you your client's worth to you is really important. And you could always look at those clients that we've talked about on the peripheral of that gold box. If you don't know what that client's actually worth, but you've only made one placement in that client, if you haven't penetrated that client enough to find out what that client is worth to you, you'll never know. It could be just one placement a year client. It could be a client that might have 50, 60 placements a year. And I've worked with consultants and I remember having a conversation with a consultant about a client and they were making five or six placements a year into the client and they were really pleased until they found there was an opposite part of that client that was doing 150 placements a year. Wow. You know, we were missing out. and We thought we had a reasonable client and a small business, but wow, we were missing out. And we lost the client because we missed out on that type of information from there. So price and pitch your clients appropriately and focus on high net worth clients because your high net worth now clients will be the ones that come back quickly and fast because they'll have the money to do so. They'll also have the drive to want to recoup the money that they've lost in this area. So you need to protect what you have and work really hard on protecting what you have. So that is how you need to build a pipeline and how you need to develop that pipeline constantly throughout this period so between now and when business starts again in earnest you've got an opportunity to be speaking to your clients and finding this information by speaking to the clients not about actual recruitment but about them and what's going on you'll start to get a far more in-depth understanding of your clients needs an understanding of their pressures of what's happening when the market comes back and by understanding their pressures you can understand how you can solve their problems and come to them as the knight in shining armor 
and give them a solution to their issues. And that starts now. If we leave it, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this, this comment that I've used in a couple of webinars before. Uh, we were talking in a webinar last week and someone said, you need to be on the coattails of your clients. And I said, I have never ever wanted to be on the coattail of my client. And the reason why I never want to be on a coattail of my client is because if I'm still on the coattail. If that client accelerates really quickly, I'm going to get flipped off that coattail. I can't hang on to that coattail. I want to be in the pocket of my client. So when that client accelerates, I am in there for the journey because I'm tucked tightly in the pocket of the client. And to do that, I had to understand everything about my client. So in the recessions in the, the early 90s, the recessions in the early 2000s, and the 2008 recessions, this is what I did as a personal person, uh, a, a recruiter in a contract market, and I grew a three quarters of a million pound contract book uh, per annum. This is what I did with my teams, and I grew huge, great recruitment teams coming out of, recruitment, out of recession and took massive amounts of market share because we knew more about our clients than ever before. And knowing more about your clients now is imperative to make sure that you survive through this process. Know who you're focusing on, know why you're focusing on them, and know what you're selling into those clients and sell it properly to those clients. That's what building a pipeline's about. So that's the end of the uh, training session. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to take any questions. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, so I'm ready to take questions. If you've got questions now, feel free to, to type them out to me. Is that everyone's typing the long questions or we have no questions? Give it another couple of minutes. As I see, most people are starting to, to drop off. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending. It's been much appreciated. I'd like to wish you all the health and wealth, you know, going forward. We do these webinars every single week, so feel free to get on them every single week. If you want to talk to me about how we can help you, feel free to give me a call. If you want your manager or your boss to talk to me, give them a call to see whether you can get more training and different training. Happy to do that. It'd be great for that. So I'd like to wish you all the best. Have a really good finish to the week. Okay, and I wish you all the health and happiness. I'll be closing the webinar in a couple of minutes. Thank you.